uh, not working? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Good presentations. A um, uh, couple of questions on on the Korean treaty. Um, th they seem to be having a bit of a selective memory issue on, on the aspects of the Korean model they've taken into the G20. I didn't hear anything about like, equity or radical land reform or some of the other features of Korean history. Um, has there been a discussion on, on, on equity issues and, 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 and redistributive issues, such as land reform in, in this model? Um, and standing back and looking at the kind of structure that's emerging, I mean, it's, it's, there's lots of sort of winners, but it's also quite, there's interesting losers in terms of the possibilities for forum shopping and incoherence between G8, G20, and other things. So, Sorry, I don't understand that. What do you mean by Yeah, that? forum shopping means um, China says, I don't want to talk about climate change here because I'm going to talk about climate change there, that kind of thing. So it means you get actually fragmentation of the system as well as some winners. So I think winners, you clearly get a much better discussion on financial reform. You get a better, you get a better inclusive approach to, to emerging markets. You, know, you, you get a number of winners. But the obvious loser is aid, because aid is going to stay with the G8. If the G8 just becomes a place where governments go to be badgered about breaking their aid promises, they're not really not going to be very excited about going there. And I'd say climate change is potentially a loser as well in that there's a low carbon transition kind of question which falls somewhere between the nature of growth which is being pursued and uh, the climate change negotiations. And, and, and so I'd just be interested in if you had to pick issues which are winners and losers from this new structure that's emerging, what would, what would it look like? I, I think that there's a kind of danger that you think that the G20 is kind of the be all and end all of everything. It doesn't, it isn't. It's not, you know, it might just be kind of new and exciting and it dealt with some kind of high profile issues in 2008 and 2009. It suddenly doesn't mean that it has to deal with everything. I mean, why should it deal with everything? It has no, frankly, it, you know, it has no, no real competency to deal with some of the you know, strategic and political issues. They're not, the the people represented on it are different. It started off life as a forum for finance ministers, with no disrespect to finance ministers, obviously. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I just think that you need to be careful about the way you frame what the G20 should do. Just because it seemed to be kind of a game in town that gets a lot of publicity doesn't mean it should do everything. Um, so that's kind of, um, my response to, you know, what are the winners and losers? I mean, just because the G20 doesn't discuss a subject doesn't mean it's a loser. That subject isn't suddenly a loser because the G20 doesn't discuss it. Um, and on the issue of climate change for the development growth agenda, um, there is a lot in there about ensuring, for example, on infrastructure of the kind of very many actions in the action plan. You know, there is kind of discussion about how do you um, institutionalize and bring in environment, common environmental standards and the creation of um, a, uh, in how you agree what sort of infrastructure you have going forward or if it's about power which is really where one of the big bottlenecks is for example in Africa it's all around electricity then how do you deal with um, um, uh, the role of renewable energy and the role of um, you know, sustainable forms of energy so that there are ways in which they are linked to the growth agenda. It's just it's not going to sit there and discuss climate change per se or the big climate finance uh, piece, which is really, a, I can see why the G20 is not appropriate because it's a redistribution issue uh, about who's, who's taking the pain and who's, you know, um, uh, who's created the problem, who's taking the pain, ha pain how, is it, how, how does a burden share work? Well, the G20 doesn't represent all of those countries, so it's not appropriate for it to have that discussion necessarily. And it's much better for the UN system to, to handle that. So I would kind of view it in that sense. In terms of um, inclusion and growth, obviously the idea is that there is no way in the, which the G20 is going to talk about this is the model of growth and development. You know, having kind of said that, frankly, the World Bank and the IMF shouldn't have talked about it either, what is the point exactly of the G20 now doing it? So there is no one model of growth room. You, know, you can't say this, these countries who are of this particular set of characteristics should have this model of growth. That's not the idea. The idea is that there are certain ingredients that people have found that are common um, to growth, and some of them have are being dealt with by other forum, fora, and some of them are not being dealt with properly or effectively or with sufficient focus. Um, they include the things that I've mentioned in those pillars that were picked on for that reason. And therefore, these are the ingredients that we will focus on and worry about. 
But the recipe for growth then has to come from the country. The recipe for growth can't come from, you know, why on earth should any member of the G20 have a view on how Liberia's, you know, what Liberia's growth <laughs> model should be and whether there should be land redistribution and somewhere else? I mean, it's just not appropriate. Okay. Let me take a few more questions. Do, Judith, no, you're passing? Okay, gentlemen at the end, and then let's have some... No, this end first, yes. Thanks very much. Um, Baroness Federa mentioned at the beginning of uh, your presentation the um, South Korean uh, growth, that the only country to go from low income to high income in one generation. With Oman. <laughs> right. Um, but also you mentioned that uh, they did that by following their own prescriptions rather than those of the international organization, IMF, UN, and so on. But I w I'm intrigued to know what you think, whether or not is the fact that they did so well by following their own prescripti prescriptions um, a coincidence uh, or are the two related, the fact that they ignored um, international prescriptions <coughs> and they went their own way and they did so well on that? You know, are the two things related? Um, the other question I would ask is, um, um, the, would the G20 quite like to talk about climate change if the other um, organizations mentioned that they uh, asked them not to do that? And I'm intrigued as to why they would not want them to talk about it. Okay, let's take, should we take a couple before, yes. just behind you? In that case, I need a, you need a piece um, Phil Sigley, Federation of Cocoa Commerce. And responding to G20, how can it make a difference? I think my question would be on the issue of coordination. Now, taking the first four items that you mentioned about infrastructure, skill creation, trade and food security, plus what uh, uh, Duncan mentioned about uh, finance and trade and networking of countries <coughs> being add-ons that G20 provided uh, over and above uh, the development agency network. Uh, and also the question, the response from the Commonwealth Secretariat about the philosophy of aid. Now I think, you know, you spoke earlier about growth rates being achieved, and, I, and I've had this with the African Development Bank before. It's actually very patchy. You'll find that the skew of donor policy in individual countries seems to favor urban areas. And that's, I can understand exactly why that might be in certain cases. But unfortunately, agriculture is left well behind. And I think under this question of food security, what, could, what more could be done? I think the, the, when you see it on the ground, this mismatch of policies where Danida does one thing, Diffid does something else, within the same community, and we talked about you know, capacity building of communities. I think somewhere in the G20, this question of coordination of effort and, and uh, aid effectiveness, maybe the working group should be looking at something where, you know, what are the realities on the ground of the impact of policies? What has gone wrong? And I, I, mean, I mean, we have been to meetings here. Simon chaired something a year or so ago between AFD and DFID. When the EU spend of, say, 50 billion euros they admitted happily to wasting seven in duplication. Now, this, this effectiveness, if it's not being done effectively, where is the vehicle between development agencies to coordinate? Can the G20 have more influence on that particular aspect? Okay, thank you. Why uh, don't you take, take, yeah. take that? Um, on the issue of the link between the prescription and the growth, um, on the basis that it's a sample of one, I suspect you can't really tell. <laughs> However, um, I think it's very clear that um, they did do some things that would not have been, uh, for, for countries that would have been less empowered and less capable as states, and Korea was, you know, they were very smart, very capable uh, uh, in, in, in a lot of ways that actually uh, some of the states that we're talking about don't have some of those capacities. There are some other problems that came with it. That's a separate issue. But they were very smart, and they were <coughs> able to see things and had a vision for themselves about what they wanted, and I think it was phenomenally successful. And th the example that they give me is, you know, building the, um, I think it's a Seoul Pusan. I think there are a couple of m better qualified Koreans in the audience that, uh, who can sort of say, but, you know, at that time, they built a piece of infrastructure that I think the World Bank and others said, what are you doing? And they just <coughs> said, well, this is what we want to do, and this is how we're going to do it. They were quite well aided, by the way, and um, but they did have their own vision, and I think that that <coughs> makes a difference. But it, the most important factor that is common between countries that grow 
and therefore achieves their targets and their MDGs in countries that don't grow is governance and the capacity of the state. That is the single most of it. There's nothing the G20 can do about that. That is, that is within the state, that is for them. There's really nothing anybody else can do. Uh, I think I already kind of answered the question on climate change. The issue of climate change is an issue of equity. It's who, who, how do you burden share between countries uh, in, the big, in the big game, in the big negotiation? That's what it's about. I don't think you can ask a group of 20 countries in a world of 190 to do that. It's just, you know. But on the kind of polluter pays principle, most of them are in the G20, right? Most of the polluters. Well, how is it then? Quite a lot of the objectors were not in the, <laughs> that 20. I mean, you know what I mean? There were yeah. a couple of objectors in the 22, but they were, you know, not. So um, I think they kind of felt that they would cook up a deal and, you know, um, yeah. they just wouldn't, yeah. it wouldn't be fair. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say something controversial on aid and linkages. First of all, I completely agree with you. So that piece is not controversial. I completely <laughs> agree with you that <laughs> essentially... I just never have never ceased to be shocked by the aid community and I'm not really ever sure I understand whether it's the aid community is for the aid community or for development but I just don't and I've just never figured it out and um, it's just you know there it is um, but I completely agree with you it's shocking it's it's immoral it's negligent uh, I don't know why we tolerate it but we do but the controversial thing I'm going to say is I'm not entirely sure that aid is relevant to growth there is absolutely no evidence to show any correlation between aid and growth. And as I sort of said, all of the evidence shows that if you want to reduce poverty, you need growth. And growth contributes somewhere, the lowest the lowest number we found is 80%, and the highest number we found is 97% to poverty reduction. So at the end of it, the focus of the G20 is on growth, because that is the single biggest difference between meeting the NDGs and not meeting the NDGs. That's the re that is what it's going to do. That is why we're going to focus on it. But also, again, going back to, there are big <coughs> donors outside of the G20, huge numbers of donors outside of the G20. Um, the Scandinavians, um, for example, the Dutch others. And I think that it's not the appropriate forum. The OECD, it's its job, that's what it does. There is a group in there and you can't just keep attaching things to the G20 to suddenly take on something that it doesn't have the correct representation for. Um, so it doesn't talk about aid effectiveness issues. It talks about the thing that I think is really going to solve poverty, and that's growth in low-income countries. Great. Well, sitting in ODI saying there's no relationship between aid and growth, you're bound to get some pushback. Um, Judith, do you want to, and then Simon, um, and then Doug? Just two points I wanted to pick up on. Sorry. That's Two the points controversial point, <laughs> which represents my personal views so, and nobody yes. else's. <laughs> it's absolutely, I'm speaking personally too, um, but with slightly less institutional background <laughs> than you. Um, firstly, on, on the issue raised behind me about coherence, the, the transparency agenda, which is now gaining a lot of traction, both with the International Aid Transparency Initiative and with the individual donors, is one way to start to address issue of coherence and empower people to address it much more effectively by knowing what people are actually spending and it would be a very good thing if that were on the agenda but it's the other is to be on the agenda for no, the okay, reasons I explained yeah, okay, but yeah, yeah but okay longer term um, but the other thing is about inclusive growth and aid and poverty. And, and I think we need to move away from this digital, is aid good, is aid bad? Because aid covers such a huge array of activities that you can't judge one type of expenditure um, against another because the outcomes <coughs> they expect are completely different. What I wanted to ask you was about, to talk a little bit more about, was the relationship between inclusive growth and poverty reduction and particularly the... Um, the, the pillar that is about shocks and food security and resilience and how people are seeing the interlinkage between resilience, reduced vulnerability and growth in, yeah. the, in the debate. I think for us the inclusive growth is just, I mean it's so inherent and integral. I mean why would anybody be interested in something that's not inclusive growth? I mean you know why would you be interested in a kind of resource driven, you know, stays within, I mean, that's just not what we're talking about. All, we're, all of the pillars, everything is really mainstreaming. It has to be sustainable, inclusive, persistent, enduring growth that reduces poverty. Otherwise, we're not really terribly interested in that because it's then something completely different. 
uh, just like different forms of aid, it's not really, you know, most of those forms of aid I don't even call aid because they're clearly there to aid somebody else, not really the recipient. So um, it's just, that's not the growth we're interested in. We are only interested in the, so it's all mainstreamed in terms of how you deal with it. On the issue of the resilience piece, that's the piece that's not mainstream, that's kind of the add-on, which is if you have a shock, which is both either internal or external, do we have the social protection systems in place and do we know enough about social protection systems to ensure that you don't lose the gains? Uh, and the issue with that is, of course, funding. And, of course, you need a degree of internal budgetary resource to deal with that because if you're going to be dependent on the stop goes, sometimes somebody might turn up and give you the right form of aid, then it's not going to happen. Okay, good. Just find uh, a short one. This is a different you. question, not about aid. You know, I sat oh, in Korea, great. and <laughs> and there was but there was growth. it isn't it's about it's about David Cameron. Actually. <laughs> uh, there was an intense and detailed discussion about things like what should be the grace period for adopting Basel III rules and regulations and oh, financial vulnerability why is this safety about David nets. Cameron? Hang on, and I sat there thinking to myself, why would you fly? David Cameron all the way around the world to discuss what is essentially a finance minister's residual agenda from, you know, from last year, if you like, from, 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 from the London summit. And I'm just curious to know what you think about the question of what leaders bring to this that finance ministers can't deliver, and whether or not the leadership engagement in the G20 is a continuing function of this group, that, and, and, and it's really going to do something finance ministers can't. I think they bring politics which some finance ministers do and some don't. I mean, some finance ministers in some countries are not politicians. They're appointed by the, by the leader, so they're politicians in that sense, but they're not elected politicians. And so, for example, the reason there was this debate about the period of um, grace before Basel III was essentially that some countries um, felt that... Um, First of all, some countries felt this was an entirely Anglo-Saxon problem and therefore would have nothing to do with them. And um, their banks didn't really have any problems, even though they blatantly did. And they've been working around that model for a while. And then to suddenly be given a higher set of standards would have meant um, something quite dramatic because, in fact, their current levels of capital are lower than the US or the UK, for example, where the problems you know arose. So there was a political issue about... Um, whose problem is it? Why do we have to accept this? Is it going to affect lending? Is it going to affect the real economy? And for countries that have politically never accepted that they had a problem with their banking system, it was problematic. And therefore, the finance ministers just weren't able to agree it. So they bring politics. Mm. And when you, if you <coughs> want to talk about the crisis in 2008 and 2009 and talking about you know, whether it was fiscal stimulus or whether it was a trillion dollars or whether it was, you know, bank recapitalization. These are intensely political decisions at certain points. And you can't always discuss them at finance minister's level. And I think that's what they bring. Okay, great. We've got 12 minutes left. And I've got um, four... To, um, I was told a quarter two, just oh, so you're aware. Oh, goodness. Is that right? Yes. yes. Oh, we haven't. We've got negative 12 minutes. And you <laughs> have to go. So actually... We're getting to the point. Dirk, I think I need to give you an opportunity to come in. We may have to close down those questions, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I wasn't aware it was quarter two. Dirk. Right. Um, well, I wanted to respond to a number of points, but let's just do, mm. uh, do one. I think uh, <laughs> there was a discussion kickstarted on thinking about aid effectiveness. Um, and we said, well, that might not be the right, uh, G20 might not be the right forum to think about that. Um, you have other forums there. But what you can do is to think about um, getting, making sure that the G20 is accountable for its actions, and particularly the G20 Development Working Group yes. is accountable. So they will publish multi-year action plans, and uh, at least that's the understanding in the Toronto uh, in the Toronto summit. So uh, they will have plans, and they can be held accountable. You can think about discussions here, and there might be some issues might be beyond aid, um, and, uh, and and they, you need to seize the opportunity. The development community then can, can think about aid, but it can also think about these new opportunities that the G20 Development Working Group brings and seize the opportunity to hold the G20 to account uh, on these issues. And that might kickstart a slightly different development uh, uh, discussion about sort of the beyond aid discussion, I think. Do you think, do you agree? Yes, I, I agree. I think you should. And I think that the more people use <coughs> the work that is published in the communique at Seoul, for I mean, for any of your purposes, the better it is because then it's getting traction and people are changing, you know, what they're doing, and um, 
even though it doesn't have some of the issues that you lobby on, for example, on aid. By the way, I, the linkage I was making is between aid and growth as mm -hmm. opposed to aid and <laughs> poverty um, um, reduction. But um, I, even though it doesn't have that, the important thing is that you recognise that it is doing something that is really central to development and that it actually behoves everybody to be aware and use it effectively or protest or hold it to account or whatever else, you know, but mm -hmm. whatever, whatever the most important thing is not to ignore it. Well, the good news is that there is a development agenda for the G20, and uh, I think it's all up to, up to all of us to kind of keep a close eye on that and keep the pressure up for that development agenda to persist over time, to be durable, yeah. along with everything else. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Apologies about the confusion on timing. Thanks very much, Dirk. Thanks to all of you. And we will keep uh, feeding ideas and issues on this agenda, so do look at our website periodically because we'll have more to say. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.